Okay, so maybe I'll um, go ahead and get started. I'm um, Professor Longo, and um, I have positions uh, both at the USC um, School of Gerontology and, um, and Norris Cancer Center, and, uh, and the IFOM uh, Institute of Molecular Oncology in Milan. Um, so um, for the long, a long time, we've been um, doing research on, um, on cancer. Uh, although we come from the, from the aging and longevity field, but uh, um, we realized many years ago that, um, that uh, uh, what we were doing, especially as it relates to fasting and fasting mimicking diets was very promising uh, for, for cancer treatment. So that's what I'm gonna talk about today. And, um, um, the uh, there's my disclosure uh, slide. So I apologize for those that are not that are not oncologists and they may not appreciate uh, or, or maybe find it difficult to understand some of the molecular aspects of my presentation. So, um, but um, but hopefully you know I'll, I'll I'll say enough general things that that you'll be able to keep up uh, with uh, with my lecture. And. Um, so why, um, why is fasting and, and particularly fasting mimicking diet, um, so why are they so promising for, for cancer treatment? And, and, and the reason is this, that um, by definition, um, if you starve a, um, any organism, most organisms are actually uh, in a starvation mode. So most organisms on the planet are starving all the time, bacteria, in microorganisms like yeast, uh, worms, etc., and then once in a while they get some food and they and they start uh, growing, and then they go back to starving for the rest of the the year, probably. And um, so, so what does that mean? It, well, it means that um, all organisms, including us, let's say the great majority of organisms, including us, are used to uh, uh, dealing with starvation periods. Right. So humans can go for one or two months with no food at all. And, um, and so, of course, for that to happen, every single cell in the human body has to be able to respond and get into a, a starvation response mode. And, um, and, uh, um, and so lots of cells, for example, that normally proliferate, they go into a non-proliferative mode and they just sit, sit, st uh, stand by. And also they have to use um, sort of a, a process of eating themselves. Um, for the purpose of surviving, right? So one of the processes is called autophagy, but it's not just autophagy, also this, at the cellular level, at the organ level, let's say, that uh, there is some uh, self-eating processes that are going on uh, in addition to, to autophagy. And uh, um, so the, the, the system starves, the, the human body or the mouse, we, I'm gonna talk a lot about mice, and uh, goes into a starvation mode, but the cancer cells have oncogene mutations, and these oncogene mutations happen to be in the same genes that controls this uh, protection that is starvation dependent. So starve the cells, the cell stop dividing, and also becomes protected against all kinds of toxins. But uh, if you have the oncogene on, as the great majority of cells, uh, cancer cells do, then by definition, you cannot become protected. Right? So this is a, what I call differential stress resistance. The, the ability of starvation to protect the obedient cells, uh, but not the, the normal cells, all of them, uh, or let's say, you know, theoretically, but let's say the great majority of normal cells, and, but not the uh, disobedient cancer cells. And so the first study was done, uh, was published a long time ago, and, and uh, uh, thanks to uh, two of my collaborators, Lisa Rafagallo and Cheng Li. And the experiment was simple. What if you take a mouse and you, and you starve it and you fast it for, for three or four days and, uh, and then you uh, give it high level of chemotherapy. And this is what happened um, if you look at cisplatin, two commonly used chemotherapy drugs. Um, now the, the mice that are fasted, they, uh, um, they all survive both doxorubicin and, and cisplatin. And these are the mice that are uh, eating normal diet. You see now, they, in this case, they all died. Um, in this case, uh, you know, 55% of them died. Um, also, 
the, uh, there's weight loss during the fasting, but then there is regain of weight. So this is uh, this uh, idea that, um, oh, you cannot starve a cancer patient, you can overfeed the patient. Uh, well, you know, unfortunately, it's, um, it's about the, the molecular aspects and, and the physiological changes, et cetera, that um, benefit the patient much more than um, overfeeding the patient and whatever benefit that the patient may, may get from, from having excess, let's say, amino acids, excess glucose, et cetera. So um, the, uh, um, and, and why is this happening? Well, uh, we, uh, we know that lots of it happens because of glucose decrease and also because of IGF-1 decrease and, and IGF-PP-1 increase, right? So this the sugar goes down, these growth factors go down and these inhibitors uh, of growth factors go, go up. And, th and this is just, this is why we like fasting so much because these are three of the thousands of changes that occur in the human body, by the way, I'll show you human data in, in a second, um, in response to fasting, right? So, so just these three would take three drugs to achieve, right? So imagine now the, the uh, the number of drugs that would be necessary to cover all the different changes, coordinated changes caused by, by fasting. And, that, and that's why we're, we're, so, uh, we're so enthusiastic about the, 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 at least the, the potential of fasting mimicking diets in, in cancer treatment. Okay, so then um, what, uh, uh, so one at a time, uh, so we'll look at glucose. And these are two drugs widely used uh, by many of you, uh, uh, cancer uh, oncologists in, the, uh, in cancer treatment. One is called dex dexamethasone uh, and the other one is called rapamycin and, and they're used for different type of cancers. Um, and uh, look at what happens. And both of them have one thing in common. They increase both in patient and in mice they increase glucose level. Uh, so you see that glucose go up in response to these two drugs. And, uh, um, and look at what happens to the survival of the mice once they're receiving both the chemotherapy, doxorubicin, and this dexamethasone, which is widely used to patients for, to reduce side effects in combination with chemotherapy. Now, the mice are dying much more rapidly, right? Uh, so, so this uh, glycemia increase is making the the chemotherapy much more toxic to the mouse, right? Much more toxic. So now you see now by day 12, they're all dead versus 50%. Uh, so the, the, the drug given to patient uh, to make it, to reduce side effects is making the chemotherapy much more toxic to the, to the mice. And so, um, and now if you add the fasting mimicking diet or fasting uh, now you can completely reverse that. So this is the effect of dexamethasone. This is the effect of rapamycin. And look at what happens when you combine uh, the dexamethasone uh, with the fasting, right? So now you completely uh, reverse um, the, uh, the negative effects of the dexamethasone or the negative effects of, of the rapamycin. Now, if you just, and we know it's sugar because if we had insulin, uh, this is enough to reverse that effect, right? So dexamethasone plus insulin, rapamycin plus insulin, you see now uh, where we, we reverse these toxic effects of the, um, of the, uh, of these uh, um, drugs. And now this, we're not even, didn't even start talking about the cancer, right? Of course, now gl glucose can also drive the growth of many cancer and cancer stem cells. And we'll talk about it in a while. Okay, so this is just uh, to show you the, 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 the movie of the star mice on the left receiving lethal dose of chemotherapy and the one on the right are, are um, so the left are uh, fasted before they, they get chemo and the one on the right are given the normal diet before they get chemo. So it's a big difference. The one on the left are just moving around like they did not uh, receive chemo at all. Okay, so uh, and, and then Many years ago, when we started uh, approaching the clinicians at USC, um, the, the concern was, okay, now you could probably uh, protect the normal cells, but if you're also protecting the cancer cells, uh, then this whole uh, idea is, is pointless. And, um, but we knew uh, from, from evolutionary biology theories that the most mutations are deleterious. 
And so cancers have lots of mutations, lots of DNA changes, chromos uh, chromosomal rearrangements, et cetera, et cetera. So then the idea was um, if, uh, uh, if you starve a cancer uh, cell, uh, and particularly if you starve in combination with stress, high levels of stress like chemotherapy, uh, the cancer cell uh, should be doing worse, not better. And so if, with the, our initial experiments, like most things we do start in simple organism, which we, we wanna look at a proof of principle, right? So is biologically, uh, is this idea, uh, does, it, does it have a very deep foundation? And so if you take, uh, I'll, I'll call them cancer-like yeast. These are, are, are simple organisms. Uh, but if you take cancer-like yeast and you give them lots of sugar, um, and then you stress them with all kinds of, of, of uh, drugs, uh, nothing happens, right? So as long as they have excess nutrients, um, they can deal with the stress. But if you starve them, uh, and now you, these RAS2 Val19 are the cancer-like organisms. And uh, you see now, if you starve them, uh, and now you give them heat shock, hydrogen peroxide, menadine, in all cases, you see a, a, a huge difference. You know, the, the difference between this and this is about 500 fold survival difference, right? Between having a, um, a normal cell and, and a cancer cell, um, now there is a, a 500 fold difference. This is very important, right? Because this is what we call differential stress sensitization. So now on one side, you protect only the normal cells. On the other side, you make only the cancer cells much more sensitive to the, to the uh, chemotherapy and other stresses, right? So now the separation can become uh, very large. And, um, and, you know, and I'll show you what some of the consequences are. Okay, so um, then jumping uh, many years ahead, um, we first started the uh, um, uh, fasting, water-only fasting trials with cancer patients at the USC Norris uh, Cancer Center. And, um, and we realized that even three days of fasting, water-only fasting, were very tough on patients. And, they were, and the oncologists also uh, did not, were not too enthusiastic about it. They were worried. Uh, so we started very slow, one day, two days, three days. And um, then eventually we went to the National Cancer Institute and the National Institute on Aging and said, uh, we think that we should develop uh, um, fasting mimicking diets. Um, and so this was funded by, by the government, uh, by the NIH. And, and uh, so what are fasting mimicking diets? The idea was, uh, can, we, um, can we feed the patients and, and at the same time get the benefits from, uh, that you, they would get from water-only fasting? And so we know that during fasting, I told you that we can survive one or two months with, the, with the, any food. So that doesn't mean that the, the cells are not getting food. We're not ingesting food, but that we have fat reserves. And these fat reserves um, in the, in the form, not just the fat reserve, but also muscle eventually, they are utilized by the body. Uh, and not just uh, fat reserves and muscle, but also lots of cells and lots of organs are, are utilized by the body. Uh, to survive. So, so they're really generating uh, in, intra-organismally uh, the nutrients that are needed. Um, so, but yet they're still in a starvation mode. So the body is, uh, is breaking down fat, is breaking down very slowly some of the muscle, and, um, but it recognizes it is in a starvation mode. So, so that's what the fasting making that does. So they, it, uh, it goes after IGF-1, IGF-PB-1, glucose and ketone bodies, some of the markers that I already told you about. And it does so by having low calorie, low sugar, low protein, high unsaturated fats. And another thing that we did was to make it uh, as healthy as possible, uh, thinking that, that that could have some extra benefits. It wasn't just any type of low calorie, low sugar, low protein, high fats, but it was the, the very healthy uh, types. Um, okay, so how powerful uh, could this be? And, and so if you look at, um, so lots of people uh, like to talk about, you know, diet and, and, and tradition and, and cancer, starving cancer, you hear all these things. And, um, and unfortunately, if you look at things that are old, in most cases they do 
uh, lots of good and lots of bad, right? So it eventually like color restriction, it sort of cancels out, right? So when you're starting to get the really good without the bad is by understanding that using all kinds of things, including let's say fasting, but understanding the molecular biology and understanding the mechanisms. And then you can take something that is good and bad and make it just good, at least uh, uh, potentially. And uh, so if you look at here, lung cancer and breast cancer, mouse models, uh, if you use uh, chemotherapy alone, you get, and this is just looking at the mice that are cured from, from the cancer. And these are both very aggressive. These are triple negative uh, breast cancer. So if you give chemotherapy, zero cures, fasting, zero cures. In this case, 20% with chemotherapy and 20% with fasting mimicking diet. But uh, what I want to show you is, is this right now. You, uh, you add, uh, you combine the fasting with the chemotherapy and, um, and now we get 60% uh, uh, cancer-free uh, survivors. And, uh, um, and let me see, I don't know if this window is in the way, but uh, yeah, uh, we get 60% cancer-free survivors and, um, and, uh, um, and that's because of what I told you earlier, right? So now the, your starving cells, but you're attacking them at the same time. And so I use the analogy of, can you imagine if you take a billion people and you put them in the desert and you put them in the desert without water and without shade. And then you ask the question, how many of them will be alive uh, two weeks later? And I think most people say none of them, right? And so now imagine a billion people, is it possible that after two weeks they, they will all be dead if they were running in the desert without water and without shade? Yes. So. Uh, so now uh, here is a similar situation. Now we, you have uh, cancer cells that are um, don't have sugar, don't have a lot of nutrients. Um, they're not protected, and they're trying to run in the sense that they're trying to proliferate. And this is not not consistent while you're also receiving chemotherapy, right? So so this is not consistent with life, uh, and this is why you see in 60% of the mice um, the cancer-free survival. And the interesting thing about this is also the, it's just got a theoretical foundation, right? So lots of the things that you take from mice to humans don't work because the, oftentimes the, they don't have a very strong theoretical foundation. They're more like trial and error. Let me try a hundred things. Oh, it works in mice. Then I'm, let me try in humans. This is different, right? So, and I'll show you some, some of the clinical data in a second. Uh, you know, it doesn't mean that there's no guarantees here because, because there is a theoretical foundation, but certainly it's, it's a major um, advantage to not just have the mechanisms, but also have a theoretical foundation for why it should work and not just, uh, well, it must work because it worked in mice. Okay, so, um, so, so here's what I just told you. So the cancer cells um, and healthy cells and if you just give chemotherapy, lots of healthy cells die and lots of cancer cells die. Uh, but now if you add that fasting or the fasting making diet, now we're starting to see much less deaths in the normal cells and much more that in the cancer cell. That's exactly what you want, particularly if this is applicable, not just to chemotherapy, but to all kinds of uh, therapies, which I'll show you in a second. So for example, um, uh, Stefano in the lab uh, did the first study on an immune uh, attack of the cancer cells. And so we, these are uh, infiltrated uh, cytotoxic uh, T cells, right? So the immune cell, you know, if you look at immunotherapy, it allows these, these T cells that essentially to attack the cancer cell. And normally the cancer cells, they, they, they have some, some way to, to tell the immune system stop. Um, so here, the same happens. So, so normally, uh, if you just give them the, the diet or the fasting, nothing happens. This is uh, the, how many, the level of um, lymphocytes, cytotoxic lymphocytes that are infiltrated into the tumor, the tumor mass, right? So, so this is with our treatment. This is with the fasting mimicking diet. This is with the chemotherapy. And now you see what happens with the chemotherapy plus the fasting mimicking diet, right? And, and these are the regulatory the, 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 the cells that tell the immune system don't attack and they're going down and the one that are attacking the cancer cells are going way up. And, uh, and this is breast cancer, triple negative, and this is melanoma, same, same effect. So now in two different cancers, we're seeing that, that the chemotherapy plus the fasting mimicking diet is allowing this, the, the, is having an immunotherapy-like effect essentially, right? So it's allowing the T cells to now recognize the, the cancer 
uh, as uh, as uh, as a antigen, if you will. Uh, and so this is just a demonstration that uh, that uh, uh, this is uh, in fact T cell dependent. I won't go into the details. And then um, you know this is the, the molecular mechanisms that I was talking about before. And now I'm just going to keep it simple because I understand this uh, heterogeneous uh, uh, audience. Uh, but um, essentially, there are this is, is, a, is a gene called hemoxygenase one, and this has a hemoxygenase one during fasting usually goes up in all the normal cells, but in the cancer cells it goes down. Right? That, that's what you want. You want to see these differentially differential effects. Uh, so that you can protect the normal cells and kill the cancer cells. And so these, uh, um, uh, let's say this hemoxygenase one was very important in, uh, it's what the fasting takes down in this uh, breast cancer and melanoma cells to allow the immune system uh, to attack. Um, okay, so then, um, then we started thinking, okay, um, is it possible to even get rid of chemotherapy? Can, can we come up with a completely non-toxic intervention? In fact, can we take two anti-aging, two protective agents, and, and make them into two protective agents for normal cells and the, and the organism and very toxic to the cancer cells? And so we took vitamin C, high dose, and uh, injectable, and then and the fasting mimicking diet, right? So, so now uh, vitamin C, um, uh, the, the Lucantili group has shown that vitamin C through making free radicals uh, can be toxic to uh, this KRAS mutated type of cancer. So that many of the cancers, uh, about a, I think a, a fourth of the cancers out there have KRAS mutations. And, um, and uh, uh, so the, um, the, the Lucantili and colleagues have shown that vitamin C can be specifically toxic uh, uh, by producing reactive oxygen species to this um, KRAS uh, um, colorectal cancers. And, um, and so Myra in, in my lab in, in, in Milan actually uh, looked at this and, and she confirmed what Lou uh, Cantley uh, uh, shown, showed. And in fact, Myra now is in Lou Cantley's lab. So went from my lab to Lou Cantley's lab. And, um, um, but then the interesting thing was when look at what happens when you add the, the fasting and this is, um, uh, you know, colorectal cancer, lung cancer, pancreatic cancer. So in all cases, uh, maybe with the exception of, of pancreatic cancer, but in all cases, there's a big uh, synergistic effect. What does it mean that, that, the, that the vitamin C plus the fasting are uh, acting against the cancer cells much more than the, the, if you added the two effects, right? So they're, they're now more than, the, more than an additive effect, it's a synergistic effect. And uh, um, so uh, this was very interesting. And then we looked at why, first of all, this depends on the KRAS mutation. So if you look at colorectal cancer, prostate cancer, ovarian cancer that does not have the KRAS mutations, it, nothing happens, right? So this is very important um, to, again, mechanisms and understanding of what we're dealing with, because uh, you know, imagine now you think all oh, colorectal cancer, it's working great. And now you go to, and you treat a patient that has uh, a wild type KRAS, and, um, and then you have a problem, uh, at least with this particular intervention. Okay, so nothing happens if, if, it's, if it's not KRAS mutated. Uh, but here, both a human uh, uh, colorectal cancer, see that um, the growth of the tumor is, is much slower when the fasting mimicking diet is combined with the uh, vitamin C. And, uh, and here you see it here. And there's the same thing happens for, for the, the same colorectal cancer, KRAS mutated for mice. Uh, again, here, and you see that all the dots. So um, the, the, the combination of the, the vitamin C and the fasting mimicking diet is able to keep the, the tumor uh, very low. And, uh, and, and why does that happen? Uh, well, if you look at the vitamin C and look at DNA damage, you really don't see anything. You don't see it for, for fasting alone, but you combine, um, you combine uh, fasting and vitamin C and now you see this big increase in the, the, the damage of the DNA of the cancer cells, right? So the cancer cells are getting attacked by free radicals. And, and here you see that this free radical level 
only in the combination of fasting plus vitamin C is going up. And again, very differential. So the normal cells are not getting affected at all, right? And uh, um, unlike what with most of most cancer therapies and not just chemotherapy. So why does this happen? Well, if you use catalase or a superoxide scavenger, and these are free radical, the free radical we always hear about uh, in, in lots of commercials now. Um, so, so hydrogen peroxide, superoxide, uh, it's sufficient to go after this to protect the, uh, the cancer cells from that, right? So then hydrogen peroxide and superoxide are responsible for these effects. And, and also we know that to really kill uh, cells, uh, um, then you have to have something that is a, um, is a, a product of uh, hydrogen peroxide, which is called a drug cell radical. And a drug cell radical is uh, usually generated by what's called phantom chemistry uh, in the presence of iron, right? So then uh, if you look at iron uh, is, is up in the cells, and then if you look at what blocks iron from, from uh, um, reacting, it's called ferritin. And this ferritin is also is up in the vitamin C group, but is back down in the vitamin C plus fasting uh, group. So what does it mean? It means that uh, if you add vitamin C or fasting, nothing happened to the free iron level. You do it both because uh, ferritin is lowered. Uh, now the iron is free and it's free to react with vitamin C, with hydrogen peroxide uh, generated by vitamin C, and then to uh, produce hydroxyl radical and kill the cancer cell. So sorry for those of you that are not uh, trained in this, but um, but these are, are the mechanisms. Uh, and, um, and this is just show that it's sufficient also to scavenge iron with this deferoxamine. So it's a iron chelator. It just sponges out iron from the system and this is sufficient to, uh, uh, to protect the cells. And, and then hydrogen, uh, heme oxygenase one, remember I told you that this is really mediating the, the, the attack of the immune system, the attack of the cancer cells by the immune system. And again, here we see this hemoxygenase oxygenase one being up in the vitamin C group, meaning that it's protecting the vitamin C treated cancer cells. But if you do vitamin C plus FMD, now it goes back down and that's what you want uh, to allow the, the cancer to die. And, uh, uh, and this is just show that, you know, just by uh, manipulating this hemoxygenase oxygenase one, uh, we can have the, uh, so if we increase hemoxygenase oxygenase one, we protect the, ca the cancer cells. And if we decrease him oxygenase one, even in the absence of fasting now, but with a drug called zinc protoporphyrin, now we increase um, the, uh, the death of, uh, of uh, KRS mutated, the colorectal cancer cells. Okay, so this is just a summary of, of what I just told you. Uh, normally um, the, uh, the vitamin C can produce some um, hydrogen peroxide, uh, but there's lots of ferritin around. And this lots of ferritin uh, is preventing this iron from uh, reacting. And uh, now you fast the cells, the ferritin goes down, the iron goes up, uh, the iron can react with the hydrogen peroxide and now uh, generate this very toxic uh, um, hydroxyl radical only again in the cancer cells. Okay, so clinical trials. The first one was, uh, um, was done at uh, um, USC, as I mentioned, it took us a long time. Uh, in, in, uh, this is Tanya Dorf and, and, and David Quinn uh, running these trials in collaboration with us. And, uh, and here already is 72 hours of water only fasting is starting to show you know, a preliminary encouraging effect compared to only 24 hours of fasting. So if you look at nausea, vomiting, neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, et cetera, they either, they, they, there's a trend for most of them to be lower um, in the 72 hours compared to 24 hours. And then this is a, a small randomized trial done by University of Leiden, uh, looking at patients at, at, at uh, breast cancer, HER2 negative breast cancer patient, and, uh, and here they're showing um, beneficial effects for erythrocytes and for thrombocytes uh, in the patients that were fasting. Um, and then um, Charité Hospital did a randomized crossover trial um, in uh, ovarian and breast cancer patients. And, and what they showed was if they were fasting, actually they were giving a fasting mimicking diet uh, um, to patients, um, 
uh, with chemotherapy, this is chemotherapy cycle one, two, three, there is no quality of life decrease and there's all kinds of quality of life uh, measures. Uh, but if they were, the patients were on the normal diet, as they were receiving chemotherapy, now there is a, um, a, 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 a decrease in, in quality of life. So suggesting that, that um, the fasting mimicking diet is protecting the patients from, the, uh, from their quality of life uh, uh, becoming worse. Okay, so the, the most impressive trial so far has been uh, uh, in 2020, uh, this done again by University of Leiden um, in, with our help. And uh, these 125 patients uh, randomized uh, trial of, uh, um, of uh, um, HER2 negative uh, uh, um, breast cancer patients. Um, this is um, uh, receiving uh, four, six to eight cycles of chemotherapy before uh, surgery. So this is HER2 negative stage two, three. Um, and, um, and so, and this is impressive because if you look at, uh, um, even though the compliance in this particular trial, uh, we all made the mistake of not having trained uh, uh, dietitians. I mean, they were trained dietitians, but they were not trained to, to understand how to deal with fasting, mimicking diets and all the things that go along with it. Uh, so the compliance was 80% to one cycle of the fasting making diet, and then it went down to 50% to two cycles, and then it went down to like 36% or something like that for four cycles or more. And uh, But in spite of that, and this is an impressive thing, uh, in spite of that, the, the non-responders went from, so the, so the patients uh, that whose tumor mass did not respond to the chemotherapy went from 27% uh, to 11%. And, uh, um, and then if you look at, uh, you break it down in FMD compliant to regular diet compliant, you see now there's a five-fold difference in the portion of non-responders. It goes from 27% to 5%. So those that actually completed lots of the fasting mimicking diet cycles with the chemotherapy are doing the best. And there is actually a, a, a dose response, right? So uh, the more cycles completed, with of the fasting making diet, the better the, the, the patient uh, uh, responded. And, uh, and so not only this is matching the mouse data that I showed you earlier, but it's also matching the uh, pathology. So now eventually the tumors are removed as surgery and, um, and then uh, they're scored uh, for uh, cancer free, so the masses can be cancer free, or, or you know they have different degrees, and this is called Miller pain scoring. Uh, so Miller pain uh, one to three, it means there are a lot of cancer cells in the mass once it's removed. Uh, Miller pain five means is the cancer is is uh, cancer uh, is free. I mean the tumor mass is cancer free, uh, and four is is ninety percent cancer free, right? So so now if you compare the uh, 90 to 100% cancer free versus lots of cancer. You see now those that were FMD compliant are doing much better, twice as, as, as good as those that were FMD not compliant or they were just on the regular diet arm. So, so this is very, very promising. And, um, and, I think, uh, um, and I think it should be already considered by oncologists uh, also because it's been so safe. And now there's maybe 10 clinical trials that have been completed. And uh, really, out of the 10 clinical trials, including some with water-only fasting, we haven't seen any uh, major side effects caused by the fasting itself, which is pretty impressive if you consider that these are some of these patients are, are, are you know, terminal uh, or in, in advanced uh, stages of, uh, of, of, the, of the cancer. So, uh, so uh, yeah, it's, that's, that's been very, very promising. And I think... Uh, um, the, the int integrative oncologist now should take the lead and in a very careful manner, um, you know, use standard of care, but also for the patients that are not responding, uh, consider this what I call the wild card effect of this fasting mimicking diets. So why wild card effect? Well, it, uh, 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 another example, is, this is we just published as the uh, hormone therapy. So, so now, uh, and I'll just be brief. So if you look at, um, if you look at the, the uh, treatment uh, with uh, um, the mice with the two drugs that are used as standard of care for, for um, um, cancer, breast cancer patients 
uh, receiving a hormone therapy. Uh, the two drugs are um, uh, either tamoxifen or fulvestran plus palbocyclin. Okay, so eventually, if you put mice on these two drugs, they do very well for a while, and then they become resistant, and the cancer uh, uh, takes over and starts growing, and then um, all the all the mice die. Okay, this is the fulvestran palbocyclin. This green, this green. Uh, curve here, growth curve. This is the growth of the tumor. But if you just add to these two drugs, the fasting mimicking diet, look at what happens. Now, not only you never have the resistance acquisition, but it, the, the tumor is driven down and down until uh, lots of the mice become cancer-free, as I was showing you earlier for triple negative, lung cancer, melanoma, et cetera, et cetera. And survival is still 100% uh, even after 180 days. Uh, and the other interesting thing was the the reversal of resistance, right? So these are resistant cells uh, treated with the two drugs. Now we had the fasting mimicking diet and you see now is the, the uh, tumor uh, uh, regresses. Okay, so then um, why was causing this effect? And this effect, and again, uh, that's why we call it the wild card effect because now the fasting is working because it goes after three different uh, three different factors: IGF-1, insulin, and leptin. And any of these three um, can affect, can help the tumor continue to grow and and contribute to the resistance acquisition that I just uh, told you about. Uh, and so now, again, as I was saying earlier, now imagine that you will need five drugs to intervene here to have the same effects. And maybe there wouldn't even be enough, right? So now you will need the, the two drugs that I just told you, fulvestan, palbociclib, plus an IGF-1 blocker, plus an insulin blocker, plus a leptin blocker, right? And that's why this is not really feasible to have this many drugs. Why? Because lots of these drugs, for example, um, uh, yeah, so lots of these drugs can, can, um, can affect uh, uh, cancer growth um, in, uh, in, in, in a negative way, right? So for example, um, some of the PI3 kinase inhibitors, um, they can uh, increase uh, glycemia in these, uh, uh, and, and the glucose now is driving the cancer. Uh, so you add a, a positive drug that has a positive effect on, 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 uh, um, on cancer growth, but at the same time, by causing hyperglycemia, is feeding the cancer growth uh, uh, that way. Okay, so what about patients uh, receiving this uh, uh, fasting making diet and hormone therapy? And, and the criticism uh, that we heard for many years uh, has been, oh, the patients are gonna become frail. And that didn't happen. Uh, this is 36 patients, two different clinical trials. The hand grip uh, uh, strength was unaltered. And actually, if you look at, and these patients now receive the two drugs, the fasting mimicking diet, and then they were asked to, to eat well, a Mediterranean diet between um, the cycles. And then um, they were asked to do a light uh, 20 minute a day uh, muscle training. Uh, and you see actually, instead of losing muscle mass, they actually uh, increase muscle function and increase lean body mass. And I, almost every cycle, the lean body mass is, is, is going up and the fat mass is going down. And as we've seen for the mice, IGF-1, leptin, and insulin are all down and, and ketone bodies are up. So, so now this, is, this was not a randomized trial on hormone therapy, uh, but certainly um, everything is starting to move in the right direction. And uh, so now together with 11 hospitals, including uh, Mayo Clinic, MD Anderson, uh, UCSF, uh, Cleveland Clinic, uh, USC, um, we uh, submitted a grant, uh, um, which was not funded, uh, to do this uh, in, in 460 patients, uh, randomized trial, but you know, we're, we're speaking to the National Cancer Institute and hopefully, um, and I encourage you to encourage the National Cancer Institute to sponsor these type of trials because we really need to have these large trials to be convincing to the, to the, um, to the oncology community uh, and, um, and to uh, move these into standard of care uh, type of uh, uh, treatments. Okay, so this I just told you, uh, fasting uh, is affecting glucose, IGF-1, insulin, leptin, the immune system, hemoxygenase-1. It's really uh, very wide acting, um, but alone it cannot do the job. It needs the immunotherapy, the kinase inhibitor, the chemotherapy, whatever it's already been identified 
by you know many decades of work by many many on, uh, uh, oncology researchers uh, and you know so we always have the most success when when we combine this with whatever it is that works the best for that particular uh, cancer and uh, i'm just gonna uh, thank uh, we already thank the people that were involved but uh, lots of people in my lab that, that were involved in uh, in both the um the basic research and the clinical trials thank you okay so let me go to uh, uh the questions and uh okay uh, so one question uh that i see you're fasting before chemotherapy and chemotherapy is done what type of fasting now often to keep helping the body to fight with it yeah so the fasting um so we have a, a, a clinic in los angeles called create it's a foundation clinic it's a non-profit um, and that's where we Shadi Vadat and a team of, uh, we have a dietitian, a, a internal medicine physician, and we have a molecular biologist, uh, um, uh, Romina uh, Cervini. And so they work together to help you. And this is whether you can afford it or not, please, please uh, contact them at createcures.org um, in Los Angeles. They can also do telemedicine and then uh, they can help you. So we don't want to improvise, right? So we don't want uh, uh, people to improvise. And also for the oncologist, um, please uh, uh, work with our, our team. Uh, they're there to work with oncologists. You know, they're, they're not there to replace oncologists. They're there to work with oncologists to make sure that all these things are, are carried out uh, and that patients don't go home and try to cook it up. You know, because as I showed earlier, it's very complicated. It, it, you know, it's timing and it's uh, timing of the fasting making diet with the type of therapy. So it's completely different. Even with the chemotherapy, it's completely different depending on the frequency of the chemotherapy. Um, and But usually, it's, say, if it was, like, let's say, chemotherapy every four weeks, it would be uh, three days before chemo and, and 24 hours after. Right? That's how we time it, usually with the bolus chemotherapy. But uh, again, don't try to uh, improvise at home. Um, uh, the eye fasting will help uh, cancer. The the uh, or growth, horm growth uh, hormone. Uh, I think this is related to uh, growth hormone. So growth hormone um, in, in growth hormone excess genes go down, are down regulated by the fasting. Um, and and so if you uh, and this is part of the. Uh, anti-cancer effects. So now, in fact, we're we're developing drugs to go after the growth hormone uh, uh, inhibition, uh, maybe together with the fasting making diet to make it, the, the fasting even stronger. Uh, yeah, we consider do we consider kinase inhibitor? Yes. Uh, um, uh, so this is what I, I showed you, and we have a paper that we're, we're about to publish where we use kinase inhibitors together with uh, with the fasting making diet, and it's working very well. And we published already several papers on that. So, um, so for the oncologist, I, I recommend uh, uh, to to look up those papers, and uh, and these were mouse papers. But we also started using it in the clinic with uh, in combination with kinase inhibitors in preliminary studies. Uh, but please, again, uh, uh, talk to. Uh, the Create Cures Clinic uh, in Los Angeles, and and they will help you um, uh, get this uh, applied in in a, in a professional manner. Um, what is recommended to wait 25 days between FMD periods? Uh, why 25, not 35 no, or 45? Yeah, um, no, it's not 25. It's not 35. It's not 45. It depends on lots of things. It depends on the patient weight, the patient immune system profile. Uh, so, are they become neutropenic? You know, are they um, are they immunosuppressed? Um, are they losing a lot of weight? Are they becoming frail? Are they becoming? Uh, are they losing lean body mass? Are, are you know, it, so lots of things are being considered, and that's again, uh, please talk to a team that has been doing this for years and don't try to improvise. Uh, how do you schedule FMD uh, like five days on, two days off? Uh, yeah, again. Um, it's not, um, it changes, you know, we use it now for immunotherapy combination, kinase inhibitor, et cetera, and every time is different. Yeah. Uh, but, but please contact, the, even if you're an oncologist, contact the clinic and they can work with you in, in identifying. And whenever they, they, don't, they don't have an answer, they contact me and we together come up with an answer. Uh, 
uh, give more details on the actual schedule of the FMD. Yeah, in, in the, the GRUD trial, in the laden 125 patient trial, uh, this was, I think, every three weeks, uh, four days of uh, Zentigen, the, the fasting mimicking diet. Uh, um, that's, that's what they tested. What are the inferences when if, 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 in high dose of vitamin C after treatment with a PCR to prevent recurrence? Should we look at FMD frequency to prevent recurrence? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, to prevent recurrence, I mean, we don't know yet, right? So, but let's say that the mouse study is very clearly showing that when you add the fasting mimicking diet, this is what we can say, right? That when you add the fasting mimicking diet, you're reducing the insulin, IGF-1, glucose, leptin. So you, you're making the cancer, many, many different types of cancers uncomfortable um, because so many cancers depend on one or more of, the, of, the, of these factors that I just listed, right? So then uh, you, you usually want to time, you want to time the, uh, the, this reduction with the standard of care to suffocate the, the cancer. So you have four or five days of combining. The problem when you combine it is that, you know, let's say with immunotherapy, right? So if you combine it with immunotherapy, the problem would be, um, you know, what if you cause, for example, too much of an attack, you know, uh, of, of, of uh, T cell activation, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what we're, we're still concerned. There are no trials that, I mean, yeah, we've done trials where we combine it with immunotherapy, but we haven't done large trials. So there's not enough trials right now to know about the safety. And that's why we're, you know, we always have to be concerned about, um, you know, how to, how to time it with, uh, with the fasting mimic, with the, the standard of care. Uh, and that's why I think it's best to talk to the team and we come up together with a, um, a, the way that is safest to the patient um, and at the same time is, is most effective against the cancer. Is there any study uh, about pancreatic cancers? Uh, yeah, we have a few patients that's going to be published soon. A few patients that were tested, particularly by uh, uh, Milan, the National Cancer Institute in Milan, and they had pancreatic cancer, and the, and the standard of care was combined with the, the, uh, with the fasting making diet. And that should be out soon, I think, in the next three or four months. Yeah, so B cell lymphoma. So we have several papers now with leukemias and lymphomas that we are submitting. This is in mice. Uh, we also followed a number of patients that had uh, leukemias and for whom the, the fasting mimicking diet has been very effective. Uh, but that's all we can say, right? So, so obviously, um, you know, we always uh, we encourage uh, um, uh, patient advocate groups and oncologists to, uh, um, to approach us and, and see if there is a way to do clinical trials. And, and we would be love to do a, a lymphoma clinical trial. But uh, I would say, yeah, talk to the clinic, talk to the oncologist, uh, uh, talk to our clinic in, in, in LA, uh, talk to the oncologist and see for the lymphoma uh, there's probably a, not a bad idea. We, again, we, we followed many patients with lymphoma uh, doing the fasting making diet. So I think it might be something that the oncologist um, agrees to. Now, keep in mind, you know, in some cases you might have a 98% of chance of, of, of uh, cure. Uh, so in those cases, uh, we're not as, uh, as enthusiastic about uh, proposing the FMD, not because we don't think it's going to work, but because we are um, worried even about the minimal possibility that we decrease that 98%, right? Uh, even though we're probably going to do the opposite, but we don't know. It's wishful thinking and, and we don't want to apply that. And we basically um, say, you know, if you have a very high chance to, of, of being cured, uh, stick with that. Uh, but if the side effects are so severe that you cannot handle it, or if the chance of, of uh, um, being cancer free is not that high, then told, you know, talk to your oncologist and talk to our clinic about combining, combining, adding the, the fasting making diet uh, to your, um, to your treatment. Okay. So many cancers are pro-inflammatory. So many have insulin resistance. So, pro, uh, so prone to hypoglycemia. How do you prevent a, a hypo? Also, um, 
hypoglycemia, well, um, the, um, I mean, I, I will assume uh, very few patients are going to have hypoglycemia in the absence of something that causes hypoglycemia, like insulin. Um, so, you know, I'm, it's a technical question, and, and that's maybe for the team uh, 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 to answer. But usually we don't really see, we haven't, I mean, maybe out of six, 700 patients that we have tested, we really haven't seen hypoglycemia. Usually it's hyperglycemia, which we take down is the problem. But, uh, um, but in some cases, there might have been issues of hypoglycemia. And in that case, you just stop the, the fasting um, or you don't allow the patient to, uh, to undergo the fasting making diet. They have already very low levels of, of glucose without using insulin you know, or, or, or insulin like or insulin st stimulating drugs then uh, yeah, the patient is already in that state that then there's something wrong and, uh, and then the fasting should not be used. Yeah. High dose vitamin C, uh, yeah, the dosing, I, I don't remember, but it's a standard dosing that has been used in many clinical trials with vitamin C. Um, and please look at the, again, found, our foundation is familiar with those tri trials and and the, the clinic, uh, the, the uh, Dr. Vadat can tell you exactly what the dose is at the clinic. Dosage range and frequency, again, talk to Dr. Vadat at the clinic. Is the fight as, as, as effective as the water fasting before and after? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, actually the water only fasting, we excluded it now. Um, most clinics around the world, most doctors that work with fasting will say, don't do water only fasting outside of a, a specialized clinic. Um, I always remind those of you that, that don't think that this is a problem. I remind you of the neurologist in Italy that, that treated with water only fasting an outpatient uh, person and, um, and this pa patient ended up dying. So, um, so it is it's rare, but it can happen. And certainly water only fasting, it's very extreme. It's very difficult on patients and, um, and uh, it should not be done. I think, I think it should, should not be done outside of a clinic, a spe specialized clinic. Uh, the fasting making diet is very different right now. You have a fair, a fair amount of, of calories and, and, and you have ways to prevent uh, extreme, uh, let's say hypoglycemia, right? That, that's part of our uh, fasting making diet to prevent hypoglycemia. So we have components in the FMD that are there exactly to prevent the, the, the patient from entering a, a, an extreme state of, of malnourishment. So five days fast, uh, five days we figure, we found that to be the, the perfect uh, time, four to five days to, to um, combine with the standard of care to maximize the killing of cancer cells without affecting, um, negatively affecting the patient, right? And, and this is why we do, let's say five days, once a month, once every three weeks to once a month or less. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's where the five days come from. I mean, we want the IGF-1, the insulin, the, the leptin, et cetera, to be very low, the glucose. But at the same time, as I just showed you, we don't want the patient to lose limb body mass, to lose grip strength, et cetera, et cetera. FMD plus sodium selenide, or I'd be interested to do lots of things, you know. But if you want to do clinical trials and you're ready to go, but please be ready. Uh, and, um, you know, it's going to take funding too. then contact us and we, we help, uh, you know, I think we have, I don't know, 30 clinical trials ongoing right now and, and not ongoing that we're doing and we're just helping uh, lots of hospitals from all over the world doing it. What type of schedule do you recommend for long-term survivors or, or breast cancer? Yeah, I recommend the, the fasting mimicking diet, uh, uh, maybe once a month to once every two months. Again, uh, talk to the doctor and make sure that um, that um, yeah, that you don't become frail, malnourished, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, again, people are asking about how many calories in the fasting making diet. Again, you know, eventually we hope this to be reimbursed by insurances and approved by the FDA. So this is, um, you know, the FDA is gonna probably go through every ingredient and make sure it's always identical, right? So, so you see how far that is from people asking me, you know, how many calories I cook up at home, you know? Uh, so that's a very scary direction. And I'm, uh, I'm completely against that because if that happens, it's gonna turn out into another, 
you know, medical community turning once again against fasting and, uh, and this disappearing, right? So this time we're, we'll try to make a stick and make sure that it uh, helps patients uh, and with all the, you know, very pro uh, promising things that I just showed you. Yeah, so the, dose, the vitamin C and the FMD were administered at the same time, right? So yeah, we want to we wanna combine them so that we have these effects on, on heme oxygenase uh, and ferritin, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, the FMD and vitamin C have to be done at the same time. Does it make sense to utilize a keto diet after chemo is complete? Or no, a keto, I mean, the FMD is a keto diet, but it happens to be a low calorie, low protein, so the keto diet um, can be very beneficial or can be even detrimental. Some cancers love ketone bodies, love fatty acid. They grow faster. Some cancers grow slower. You know, some keto diets lower insulin and lower IGF-1. Some keto diets don't, right? So this is why I think in general, we have never seen thus far, we have never seen a negative uh, effect of the fasting making diet. It doesn't mean that it's not going to come around, but... Uh, uh, th thus far, we haven't seen it, so I, I think FMD should be uh, considered by the oncologist and uh, and by clinical trials for sure. Uh, the ketogenic diet, yes, in in uh, you know it's it's gotta be based on lots of data, and if the data is positive, then I think the ketogenic, diet, for example, for glioma right now, we're looking at fasting mimicking diet plus the the ketogenic diet, uh, alternated with the ketogenic diet, and uh, and that's probably the best the best way to go. Yeah. Should FMD be done monthly for a slow-growing cancer that is in pretreatment? Yeah, so that's what we're using. Talk to your oncologist, but that's what we're using for some leukemias. Um, you know, before there is a, a standard of care, so in the in the watch and wait period, uh, it's been working very well. Uh, patients taking the, the FMD. So talk to your oncologist, and you know, since this is not yet treatable, um, could you intervene with a nutritional intervention? And and the answer is possibly. Uh, talk to the clinic. Uh, or your oncologist, uh, or both, and, uh, and make a decision. Is it necessary advice to use pre prepare Yeah, I mean, it, you should use the clinically tested kit. I told you, uh, for disclosure, I founded uh, El Nutra, um, and, um, but at the same time, I give everything to charity. I don't make a penny out of it. Um, but again, it's very, very important to standardize this and, uh, uh, and only when it, it is uh, probably approved by the FDA or certainly uh, allowed by the FDA, uh, if not approved, uh, um, that that's when I think we're going to start seeing this becoming standard everywhere. Yeah. So yeah, the people are asking where well, I was not able to, uh, to get the product yet. So I'm pushing the company um, hard to, to, to try to find a solution and something, you know, maybe even like a large clinical trial where everybody can enter. That's what we did in Italy. Now we're doing it now with the, at the foundation, right? So that may be uh, soon enough. I think we're going to open a large trial where we allow all cancer patients to come in and probably get the, get the fasting making diet for free. Or, or certainly low cost. And, um, and so, yeah, contact again, createcures.org uh, clinic uh, and foundation and ask them, um, you know, how you can proceed. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll find a way to, um, they'll find a way to, uh, to get you uh, uh, going with this. They, they repeat the name of the clinic. Yeah, createcures.org, www.createcures.org and look at the clinic and then you can make an appointment. And I think they do mostly, they can do things telemedicine right now. Uh, the internal medicine physician is Shadi Vadat and uh, the administrator there is Deb uh, Henderson. And uh, you can um, talk to her about, uh, about this. Uh, could you specify limitations, side effects, and words of caution about your FMD commercial diet supplement that you recommend? I mean, 
a word of caution um, is again, uh, it's not approved by the FDA yet, uh, but it's been tested on hundreds of patients in many clinical trials. Um, so, so the safety record is, is very, very good uh, right now. The efficacy, yeah, a couple of trials now are showing efficacy. The one that I just showed you, um, you know, reducing the, the non-responders by, by about threefold. Um, so that looks very promising. Of course, the mouse data is, is extremely promising, but uh, yeah, then talk to the oncologist, talk to the, uh, the team at the uh, QA clinic, and, uh, and then uh, together with your oncologist, make a decision uh, about the, uh, the commercial FMD, uh, if, if, if you want to do that, or, um, uh, or, or, or allow the clinic maybe enter the clinical trial. I don't know how long it's going to take, uh, how much longer it's going to take to open the clinical trial, but I know Shadi Datovadat is working on that. So hopefully soon you'll be able to enroll in their trial. Yeah, you don't contact me, but you can contact uh, uh, the clinic and then, uh, or um, um, yeah, you can contact the clinic and then uh, if they need to uh, involve me, they will involve me and, and oftentimes they do. Um, yeah, so somebody just put up the, the link for the Create Cures uh, uh, Foundation uh, website. Uh, yeah, BRCA mutation. We are actually doing a trial in, in Sicily about with BRCA uh, patients, um, and uh, it's still early. We're still, you know, it's going very slow. But um, yeah, we're we're testing that. Is the is the cancer incidence affected by, um, or at least are the markers that uh, the the, uh, the respond to the use of the FMD changing in a way that we. Um, uh, we think that the the, the BRCA mu uh, patients will not um, will not develop the cancer uh, because, of course, it's going to take too long to to uh, to wait for uh, progression free survival. And um, um, so, yeah, so we don't know. I, the answer is we I don't know about BRCA mutants, but we're working on that, uh, and uh, and uh, at some point we will we will publish that. I would like to volunteer to, uh, to be studied, <laughs> contact the clinic, and once the, the, stu the uh, study opens, uh, uh, you'll be contacted if you're a cancer patient. Yeah, but I mean, this is a good example of, of, yeah. So somebody's asking, is a fruit only diet essentially IFMD? Uh, no, I mean, you know, the fruit only diet would be a terrible, it would not be an FMD, it would be a terrible diet to have during cancer. Um, because it's full of sugar and, and lots of other um, uh, carbohydrates. So, so yeah, no, this is the fasting making diet is a very specific, uh, I think it's got 66 ingredients in it and that every single ingredient is studied to, to get, to achieve the, the effects we're trying to achieve. Um, doing the FMD monthly and any added effects to adding up 16.8? No, uh, no, no 16.8. I mean, uh, well, if you have cancer, talk to your and you're not um, in your, let's say, overweight or you can afford to lose some weight, I think 16.8 uh, may not be a bad idea together with the FMD just to drive the glucose even lower temporarily. No, so let's say for three or four months, as long as you keep a, a good weight. It might not be a bad idea. There is a study showing that women that fasted for 13 hours or more uh, after um, diagnosed with, uh, uh, with uh, breast cancer, they survive longer um, in combination with whatever standard therapies. Uh, yeah, so there is some, some evidence from lar fairly large studies suggesting that. that uh, so I don't usually recommend it for normal people, but if you're a cancer patient, and, uh, and you can afford, again, talk to their clinic uh, doctors because you know, every patient should be considered uh, separately. Uh, and, um, and so I don't know the answer, but I say in general, it may be that the 16-8 <coughs> for, for, uh, for a few months or, or maybe <coughs> even longer could be, uh, could be helping uh, making sure that the cancer cells are, are all dead uh, um, in the, during the treatment. Yeah. 
Okay, so that was it. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And, um, and, uh, and that's it.